So my name is Erik Fatland, or Fatland, I know it's fun in English. Uh, I have a Norwegian passport. I have a master's degree in new media. And I have a job in financial services. I'm 37 years old. And for 20 of those 37 years, I've spent very large chunks of my time, uh, my spare time and some of the time when I should have been working or studying, uh, playing games of make-believe together with other adults. <laughs> uh, I'm a LARPer. Yes, I have hit my friends repeatedly with rubber swords. <laughs> I've also performed strange rituals in dark forests. I have been dumped by women who were never my girlfriend. <laughs> I've also hooked up with guys, despite neither of us being gay. I have been a character in an Ibsen play and a character in a Monty Python comedy. I've lived for a week in the year 1942, another week in the year 40 AD. And altogether, um, I participated in a few hundred LARPs, and I don't know how many hours I've spent on this hobby. And as if playing LARPs does not take enough time, I have been and continue to be a LARP designer, one who sets the stage for others to play. I've invited players to be grungy resistance fighters at a musical LARP, to be traumatized refugees at an asylum ref uh, reception center, ordinary people waking up as prisoners forced to face impossible moral choices by a disembodied voice. And at the tender age of 21, I was the main guy responsible for locking 120 young people up in a mental asylum it was no longer a mental asylum. Uh, we used it to pretend that we lived in the year 1984, as depicted by George Orwell, for five days. Now, society has, on multiple occasions, let me know that um, this isn't really entirely acceptable. <laughs> you should have seen the media attention after the uh, 1984 game. But friends, relatives, co-workers, teachers, and so on, keep implying, just hinting, sometimes being outright, that if I had done something, from something else, if I'd worked harder towards being able to buy a BMW and a larger house, or to feed a growing family, or volunteer to help the poor and the destitute, or sell my alt talents as a writer or as an artist, or maybe kick a ball around on a grassy field, that would all be good, acceptable, decent ways to spend your time. But that the passions I direct towards role-playing, though they are tolerated, we live in a tolerant society, they're also kind of weird and irrelevant. So while it has been ge getting better in recent years, I obviously have felt the need to ask the question myself, does LARP matter? And to tell you the truth, I'm kind of ambivalent. On sunny days, I see in live role-playing the potential for transformation of the role-player into a more fully human, ri re uh, realized human being, and of art towards more democratic forms, uh, capable of depicting the human condition with a degree of intimacy and realism uh, that is unthinkable in the spectator arts. But on rainy days, I think it might be just an incestuous, self-indulgent, and a glorious waste of time. But I'm convinced that LARP design matters, more than LARPing itself and to more people than the people who design and play LARPs. And I'm here to talk about why I think that's the case. Now, let's look at what LARP designers do. This is a still from uh, Panopticorp, a LARP play twice, 2003, 2013. Uh, it's set in a fictive advertising agency. And the entire written material for this LARP consists of a dictionary, 30 words and their explanations. And the words are the office jargon of this agency. They use terms like nexic, which kind of means cool, but if you say cool, that's not nexic, that's Monday, and Monday is bad. They use words like hot knot, which is a vote that is held daily to determine your corp cred, which in turn determines whether you have a job or not. Now, by adopting those 30 words, players learn enough of the mindset and the work ways of working and office routines and so on uh, of Panopticorp that are able to sub simulate a dark, cynical advertising agency with some humor and an alarming degree of immersion. The Danish Lob Totem 2007 uh, used a series of drama techniques, several workshops in advance, that turned a group of young Scandinavians into two rigidly hierarchical and highly complex tribal societies. For example, they reportedly, I was not there, but reportedly used the rule that uh, it is inconceivable 
to uh, talk about someone who isn't here with us right now. And based upon a set of these simple rules and workshops in body language and so on, these highly complex and subtle societies emerged. America, well, this is America in Oslo, Norway, in the year 2000, um, worked with also a group of ordinary young Norwegians, no actors, no special talent, worked with them over three weekends, defined their characters through dharma exercises and so on, and then placed them in the midst of this huge pile of garbage, which was actually very cleverly scenographed, like the you could walk around there, hide inside there, and so on. There were plenty of things to discover. And by doing so, uh, they were able to bring not just a life, a uh, society of the 30, 40 people who had been to those workshops, those 30, 40 people were able to drag in 100 more people into this society, b living on this air. And as you can see, this picture is taken from above. There were thousands of people who watched this in real time, stood there glued, looking down on the world out there. Now, we LARP designers, we do our thing by inviting players to act as if. As if they are knights, as if there is a dragon, or as if they are a group of immigrants celebrating Easter. There are many kinds of LARP. And LARP, of course, is not unique in asking us to pretend as if. Children do it all the time. Adults do it too. If I tell you a story where somebody says, um, like the, the story ends with somebody saying, fuck off! then uh, you don't actually act as if I just told you to fuck off, do you? Um, because you know that I'm acting as if I was a guy saying fuck off, and you are acting as if I didn't. Now, this is not just a matter of games or stories, of metaphor. As Marcus Montel explores in his PhD thesis, which everyone should read even though it's very difficult, um, there is a great deal of human society is built in different ways on what I would say people acting as if. As if the bread consumed at Eucharist is the body of Christ. As if the policeman who just arrested you is an embodiment of the state and not just a person like you. As if a sound, stone, is related to an object, physical stone. And as if this here piece of paper is the equivalent of a cow. Now, when we design LARPs, we are playing basically with the building block blocks of culture, not just our fictional cultures, real culture as well. But asking people to act as if is not enough to make a LARP. As LARP writes, we need you to act as if together. Because if I act as if I am a merchant from the fictional city of Libidibi, and I meet you, and I greet you like this, then you have no idea whether what I did was actually a symbolic compliment to your eye color or a grave insult towards the grave of your mother. So to enable role playing, I need to identify the rules and the symbols that actually matter. And I need to reduce these to their minimum components, their minimum requirements, not a whole language, but the 30 words that matter, not a whole society, but the body language and the rituals that create a behavior that is most different from our own. And then I need to communicate those requirements so that's not just the one guy from Libby Dibby who knows what this means, but also some other people who can interpret it. And then there is drama, there is action, there is society, and we have LARP. And I cannot micromanage the players. That's a big advantage of being a LARP designer as opposed to like a theater director, a writer, whatever, you know. Um, they're going to do their own thing no matter what. I need to ensure that the tools that I give to players, the body language, the characters, the ideas, the language and so on, that they work together, they fit together, and then they allow them, those players to improvise something that also fits together and becomes increasingly beautiful or increasingly funny or increasingly profound. So the bottom line is this, that what we do as LARP designers is to describe and communicate the minimum requirements needed to direct human creativity towards a shared purpose. And directing human creativity towards a shared purpose is not a small thing. It is the primary challenge of any project, any community, of small businesses and of corporations, families and clans and dynasties, cities, nation states and civilizations. There are uh, resolutions to all of the big questions of our time, whether it's getting rid of dog, dog poo on the sidewalk or solving the climate change crisis. All of these are basically problems of directing uh, human creativity towards a shared purpose. 
while that's not a small thing, it is a very, very challenging thing. Now, let me first tell you about something that isn't very challenging, and that's to direct humans towards a shared purpose. Not creativity, but just human beings, their bodies, and their ability to control those bodies. We know very well how to do this. Uh, we threaten them. We punish them, we hit them, we tell them what will happen, we fill them with a bit of fear. We might tell them grand lies for them to believe in and so on. Uh, but eventually they internalize that fear, they replace your voice with a voice inside their head telling them to go here, read this, do that. But directing human creativity is much harder. Because creativity describes our ability to generate and execute ideas. Creativity is a complex problem solving. And creativity does not thrive on fear. Now, all authorities in creativity agree on this, that it requires fearlessness. It thrives on playfulness. And creativity also does not thrive on solitude, despite the myth of the soul, uh, soul, soul, uh, soul genius. Neither Einstein nor Picasso would have been worth very much if they did not have a common language with other physicists, other artists, if they, there were no people who challenged them, listened to them, continued their work. And so this is where we find LARP and LARP design. Now, obviously, we're not alone in working with issues of directing cr creativity towards a shared purpose. There are many others. There are art directors, theater instructors, service designers, game designers, process planners, information architects, politicians, activists, teachers, urban planners, managers of so many different kinds and stripes, project managers, mid-level managers, etc., etc., scrum masters, Six Sigma, uh, black belts, and so on. And then there are also plenty of people who are researching this. Sociologists, social psychologists, game design scholars, and so on and so on. There are lots of people who are worried about directing human creativity towards shared purposes, not just us. So, what makes us special? Why are we unique? I think we have two basic advantages over all these other fields. The first advantage is that we prototype, and we prototype rapidly. Now, in the Nordic LARP tradition, we have simulated the institutional structures of slaveholding societies, advertising companies, IT companies, real and fictitious militaries, we have lived in societies with four genders and no genders. We have recreated daily life in the years 1349 and 1942 and 10,000 BC. We have experienced the inner dynamics of hundreds of societies, thousands of families. Our art might be based in games of make-believe, but by enacting those beliefs with our whole bodies, we make temporary realities. And nobody else does this. There's no other branch of knowledge or practice that can build a religion test it out for five days, how it feels to be a believer, how belief affects action, uh, and then use that experience to build another religion next year. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> the idea is inconceivable, right? But we do this all the time. Uh, now, the speed by which we can put imaginary social and creative constructs to the test enables us to learn much more quickly than other, any other discipline. And secondly, we are multidisciplinary. Now, I'm speaking here on the evening before the beginning of the 70th Knutpunkt conference, uh, which since 1997 has been keeping a conversation going on LARP design, LARPing, LARP theory, and so on, uh, and where we've been basically uh, using whatever uh, we can come upon, experimental LARPs and various branches of knowledge, uh, in order to improve the practice of LARP design. And you know what? I mean, all of these professions are in this room now. We may be multidisciplinary as a result of our passions for LARP, that when we need to make a living, when we are drawn to adjoining fields. But the kind of professions that actually pay you in real pieces of paper. But we are also multidisciplinary because we have to be, because LARP can depict the to totality of human life and so must draw on the totality of human knowledge. Does LARP design matter? The toolbox of LARP design contains ideas and symbols and rules and practices. These tools, in turn, allow us to build groups and companies and cultures and institutions. The tools come from any and all branches of art and science. The tools keep getting tested and refined. Some tools we have thrown away. Many others we have made sharper. And we still discover new tools. And so the toolbox keeps evolving, and we are getting better at understanding those tools and at teaching those tools to others. We're not really there yet, to be honest. It's only two years ago that we started figuring out how to teach LARP design, 
and then started realizing how much we still needed to figure out because you need to know your thing to teach it, right? But I think we're getting there. And as our toolbox evolves, I believe we will find, and that we are already finding, that we can put the same tools to use to design real symbols, rules, roles, and practices, and hence new kinds of culture, organizations, and movements. As such, LARP design represents a new kind of leadership, not the leadership of hierarchy or intimidation, not a kind of le leadership that is easily transplanted into our schools and companies, but a leadership that works by inspiration and by invitation, building better playgrounds rather than pushing kids around, a kind of leadership that will found institutions, instigate movements, and that may come to empower us with the rules and roles and symbols we can use to bring forth the best in ourselves and to work towards realizing our highest aspirations. And this, I think, is why LARP design matters. Thank you.